starting with uh, Ian Reeves. Uh, Ian is a PhD student at the University of North Carolina. He also won this year the Savitsky Student Modeler Award. So a big applause, which is kind of weird in this virtual environment. Um, Ian has a strong uh, numerical background in modeling coastal systems. And today he will present how seagrass dynamics impact the coupled long-term evolution of barrier, marsh, and bay systems. So let's see if we can get Ian's screen up there. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead. Ian. There, you see the slide now? Yes, yes, got your slide and we can hear you. Thank you. So I'm excited to share with you this project of mine that investigates the ways in which seagrass impacts the evolution of bear island cultural systems uh, with a new coupled model of mine. And this new model uses parameterizations uh, developed um, with data from the Virginia Coast Reserve Long-Term Ecological Research Site, uh, which is where this picture of a back bear marsh in the bay comes from. So bear marsh systems consist of a bear island separated by, uh, from the mainland by salt marsh and a shallow bay. And they're especially valuable both economically and ecologically, being often heavily populated um, some of the most productive and diverse ecosystems known. But the low relief of these landforms often results in a very dynamic system that is vulnerable to sea level rise, changes, and sensitive and storms. So bear islands and salt marshes are naturally resilient environments. So in response to sea level rise, bear islands tend to migrate upward and landward to maintain their sub maintain their subaerial exposure, and this is done through the process of overwash, where sediment eroded from the shore base and beach is transported landward of the dune crest during storms. And marshes maintain their elevation relative to sea level through both physical and biological feedbacks that couple the rate of sea level rise with the rate of soil accretion. So these feedbacks allow many marshes to survive moderate accelerated sea level rises. But if sea level rise is too high or overrush fluxes too low, bare islands respond by disintegrating and drowning in place. Um, similarly, if sea level rise is too fast for some accumulation on the marsh platform to keep pace, marshes will drown. But uh, marsh shed collapse can also occur from wind wave erosion at the marsh edge. So recent studies have highlighted um, the importance of the interaction between adjacent subsystems in determining the behavior and evolution of the system as a whole. And have brought to light the important ways in which bare islands can impact back bear marshes and back bear marshes can impact bare islands. But now looking at the back bear bays, seagrass can also potentially impact the evolution of the coupled system by altering the sediment dynamics and ways within this environment. So first, uh, seagrass reduces the wave height in the bay. So therefore it reduces the wave energy reaching the marsh edge and shorelines. And additionally, seagrass um, attenuates the wave and current shear stresses acting on the sediment bed. Um, so this reduces resuspension and enhances deposition of fine sediments. This occurs both within the meadow itself, but also in the surrounding bare areas of the bay. So these effects, along with um, the production of organic matter within the meadow, tend to result in seagrass beds having shallower equilibrium depth. Uh, but the bare portions of the bay will also tend to be shallower than they otherwise would in the presence of seagrass. So these dynamics suggest that seagrass can play an important role in the evolution of the entire Bear Island marsh and bay system, but no study has previously examined these systems coupled together. So this work aims to investigate the long-term impact of seagrass on bear marsh bay systems by incorporating seagrass dynamics of the back bear bay into the existing bear marsh model G++ to create the new model G++ seagrass. So GBUST++ seagrass is a two-dimensional cross-shore morphological behavioral model that simulates the morphologic and also stratigraphic evolution of a bear island transect over decades to millennia in response to sea level rise and sediment decline. And the model is unique in that it allows the user to define distinct stratigraphic units with distinct sediment characteristics. And these Units are labeled here on the left, um, along with the proportion of sand relative to mud for each unit in brackets. So in this 
new integrated model um, where seagrass can grow and how dense it can be is determined by the depth of the bay and the distance from the marsh edge. And then in turn, the location, size, and tree density of seagrass meadows in the model reduces the equilibrium depth of the bay and attenuates the wave power reaching the marsh edge, which tends to um, result in less volume of marsh erosion. And all of these relationships and dynamics were parameterized using empirical data um, from seagrass experiments, as well as morphologic data sets at the Virginia Coast Reserve, LTER. So here's a short animation of just some example stimulation from the model, where you can see a, the Bear Islands creeping landward, um, the meadow in the bay in the green, uh, the marsh eroding and the bay deepening. And you'll notice that uh, eventually the bay becomes too deep for seagrass to persist, so the meadow goes away. So in the model, sediment is brought into the back barrier basin via the bay sediment flux. And this represents the volume of sediment imported into the bay from a combination of fluvial inputs, temporary storm surge channels, and inland exchange. So this fills the combination space in the bay. Um, sediment uh, can be lost from the back bear basin via the export flux, which is the fixed percentage of suspended sediment that's eroded from the bottom of marsh edge that is lost from the back bear to represent inland sediment export with the notion. So sediment eroded and lost creates the combination space within the bay. And so it's this competition between back barrier space being created versus space being filled that determines whether or how much a marsh will prograde or not. And so after developing GBUS plus plus CBS, I ran three sets of experiments to look at the impacts of CBS on both, both the um, adjacent marsh and the non-adjacent Vera Island. And so this first set of experiments looks at the effects of CBS on marsh width. So here I ran sim uh, simulations with and without seagrass at 48 combinations of relative sea level rise increasing on the x-axis and base sediment flux increasing on the y-axis. I then calculated the difference in the final width at the end of each simulation um, between the corresponding seagrass and no seagrass pairs at each location across the parameter space. And this is represented by the coloring where red means the marsh was narrower seagrass and blue means the marsh was wider seagrass. I uh, then, uh, the marsh is prograding in the simulations above the diagonal line and are eroding the simulations below the diagonal line. And then lastly, I ran this exact primer space with three different export flux values. So zero, meaning all sediment was conserved within the back barrier basin, um, which I've shown here, as well as 15% and 25%. So for prograding marshes, um, I found that in all cases, the marsh is wider with seagrass. So therefore, seagrass enhances marsh progradation. And this is intuitive because as I mentioned before, seagrass tends to decrease the volume of marsh eroded by attaining widths. For eroding marshes, where some of the suspended sediments in the back buries exported to the ocean, the marsh is also wider with seagrass, so therefore seagrass reduces erosion in this case. But for eroding marshes where all sediment is conserved within the back barrier, um, I find the seagrass tends to do the opposite and surprisingly enhances erosion. So the question is why does seagrass tend to reduce marsh edge erosion when some sediment, or sediment is exported from the bay, but increase marsh edge erosion when export is negligible? Well, um, seagrass reduces the volume of marsh eroded by attenuating waves, but there are other less intuitive mechanisms that drive the patterns observed here. So first, as the marsh expands further into the bay, the seagrass meadow tends to shrink because the encroaching marsh reduces available seagrass habitat. And the sediment that's eroded from the edges of the shrinking seagrass meadow is then able to be transported to the marsh, resulting in further marsh degradation and further, further seagrass loss. So this is a positive feedback. In the reverse case, an expanding seagrass meadow coupled to a receding marsh can sequester sediment that would otherwise be delivered to a marsh and thereby increase marsh erosion. So second, um, the presence of seagrass results in a shallower bay and thus a shorter marsh scarp. So all other things being equal, a shorter marsh scarp requires more lateral marsh erosion than taller marsh scarp for every unit volume of sediment eroded. So considering this hypothetical case here where the marsh scarp with seagrass is half of the scarp without seagrass, 
In order to erode the volume of V, the marsh has to erode laterally twice as far in the presence of sea ice. And so the reverse is also true where a shorter marsh scarp will tend to prograde more under this same principle. So of the three mechanisms that I've discussed, only, um, so that's less the marsh volume eroded, and then sequestration of sediments in the shallow equilibrium depth. Only the reduction in the volume of marsh eroded decreases lateral erosion rates, whereas the other mechanisms tend to increase lateral erosion rates. So when all sediment is conserved within the back layer, the ability of seagrass to reduce the volume of marsh sediment eroded becomes basically inconsequential. Um, because most of the sediment eroded will just go back to marsh eventually. So under these conditions, the other mechanisms that tend to increase erosion rates control the evolution of the marsh. And this particular finding, of course, is only really relevant to natural systems where the back barrier sediment loss is very small. So we can conclude that seagrass increases marsh predation rates and under many circumstances reduces erosion rates, but may enhance marsh erosion when the back barrier export is negligible. And so this second set of experiments demonstrates the impact of adding or removing seagrass to or from the bay. So these are four simulations showing marsh width over time in which seagrass is either added or removed after year 100. And the input, input parameters were set to produce either eroding or prograding marshes. And the black lines are the control cases for each simulation in which a state change does not occur. So from this, we can see that the removal of seagrass causes a significant marsh progradation event. So as the seagrass disappears after the first 100 years, the bay bottom erodes to its new deeper equilibrium depth, which sends an initial pulse sediment um, that's eroded from the seagrass meadow to the marsh, causing the marsh to prograde. When sediment is added, um, seagrass meadow and the surrounding bare portions of the bay sequester all of the sediment delivered to the bay until the bay bottom reaches its new shallower equilibrium depth. So during this time period, the marsh receives less sediment than otherwise would, causing it to erode more rapidly. And I think this particular model result may be especially relevant to seagrass restoration projects that could perhaps unintentionally impact adjacent marsh in undesirable ways. So these results emphasize the role of sediment as an essential but limited commodity where the growth you know, preservation of one land form is necessarily at the expense of uh, other couple of land forms. And then this last set of experiments investigates the effects of seagrass on barrier island migration. So these simulations run for 1,000 model years, both with and without seagrass, using varying base sediment flux to maintain constant marsh widths of zero, 2,000 meters, and the back barrier basin completely full of marsh. So when no back barrier marsh exists, the presence of seagrass decreases island migration rates. But when the back barrier marsh is greater than zero, seagrass has no effect on my island migration rates. So in the model, seagrass decreases the depth of both the seagrass and bare portions of the base, so it reduces back barrier accommodation space. And reduced accommodation means less sediment needs to be eroded from the front of the island and deposited behind the island in order for the island to maintain its elevation relative to the sea level, so therefore it can migrate landward more slowly. But there's a reduction in accommodation only impacts uh, migration if it's within the zone over which overwash reaches the bay and the bay island migrates, so that is only if the marsh is essentially not existent. Um, otherwise, if the marsh does exist, the island migrates even more slowly, and seagrass has no impact on rate of migration. So in the absence of marsh, these results suggest that seagrass can help perhaps stabilize the islands and reduce their vulnerability to sea lines. And with that, I will leave you with the key findings of the sort as I take any questions. <laughs>